Tamriel, Dawn's beauty in the language of the Altmer, or Tazukan in the dragon's tongue, is the continent upon which all the Elder Scrolls games take place. Home to many diverse races, and even more conflicts, Tamriel has been host to many adventures. You've experienced Tamriel in your own way, but want to learn more about its story? Well, to get to the heart of the story, you have to go back to the beginning. They call it the Bleeding Heart of Tamriel. So many have spilled their blood for the Ruby Throne, it's a wonder why the Nibbin River doesn't run red. As Tamriel's centralmost province, Cyrodiil has become the ultimate seat of power in Tamriel. With the White Gold Tower acting as the Citadel of Civilization, Cyrodiil is arguably the most influential of the Nine Provinces. It cannot be disputed. The events that take place in Cyrodiil are liable to echo in every corner of the continent. Like the Red Diamond at the center of the Amulet of Kings, Cyrodiil lies at the center of Tamriel. This crown jewel of the provinces is dominated by lush green forests and crystal blue rivers. At times rivaling the natural beauty of Valenwood, this land has been written about since mortals had hands for writing. The fertile river valley of the Nibane Basin has made certain citizens of the heartlands the wealthiest people in the empire. The finest wines and ripest fruits are plucked from the fields of Cyrodiil, making it the breadbasket of Tamriel. Aside from its fertile reputation, Cyrodiil does have varying climates. Since Cyrodiil borders nearly every other province, there is a climate suitable for everyone. Near the borders of Black Marsh, are the swamplands of Blackwood, a place an Argonian can call home. In the north, bordering Skyrim, cold snow-covered mountains offers a place for the resilient Nords. Aside from Cyrodiil's diversity, primarily human emperors have wielded their power from the strategic center of the continent, and because of this, many simply call Cyrodiil the Imperial Province. The Imperials They've conquered many civilizations on the battlefield, but they are most known for their skills in diplomatic relations. Theirs is a race of silver tongues, and it has brought them more glory than any sword ever could. Whether it be getting a pompous elf to offer peace terms, or bartering a Khajiit out of his last bowl of moon sugar, the Imperials have an act for talking their way out of just about anything. This mastery of speechcraft is a most valuable gift to have, and it is no small reason why the Imperials have successfully managed cooperation between the other mortal races. Any alliance where men and elves must call each other comrade requires a certain charisma, a charisma that the Imperials seem to wield with ease. For an Imperial, the tongue and quill are the deadliest weapons. But on the battlefield, this race of men are more than capable fighters. Imperials are known for their discipline and training of their citizen armies. Their forces boast a discipline and strategic mindset rarely seen outside their great empire. Their boasts are well founded. Cyrodiil has produced some of the greatest military tacticians Tamriel has ever produced. The Imperials are physically less imposing than the other races. They are not as strong as their Nord cousins, nor as magically adept as the Bretons. Even so, Imperials are renowned for their remarkable skill and training as light infantry. This flexibility has helped the Imperials stay nimble on the battlefield, thus able to switch tactics more easily. A Nord might question the strength of an Imperial sword arm, but then again, that Nord is likely found serving in the Imperial Legion. The Imperial Legion proclaims itself to be the most disciplined and effective military force in history. Its mission? To preserve the peace and rule of law in the Empire. 
In peacetime, the Legion serves primarily as a garrison force, manning forts, patrolling roads, and providing guardsmen for towns and cities. During conflicts, the Legion serves as an invading and occupying force, overwhelming opposition with pure numbers and strategic planning. You can say that one of the major factors of the Legion's widespread success and fame springs from their military tactics. The Legion isn't known for rushing into battles they cannot win. Every aspect of warfare is accounted for in Legionary operations, and the Legion is careful to analyze every avenue of action. People would say another factor of their success can be attributed to their unmatched versatility. The Empire is made up of elves, men, and beasts. The Legion recruits individuals of all races and creeds into its ranks and benefits immeasurably from the diversity and skills they all bring to the table. This diversity is woven into the very fabric of Imperial society. The Imperial way of life is defined by cosmopolitanism. Every race on Tamriel, no matter how alien their culture, belongs to a single community. Both men and Mur have a mortal sense between good and evil, and through that shared morality, the Imperials cradle civilization itself. Now, as a race, the Imperials aren't immune to bigotry and intolerance, but in general, the average Imperial does know how to put their best foot forward when dealing with the other races. This spirit of cooperation certainly lends to the fact that the Imperials have excelled at trade. Their society is built on the efficiency of the Empire's extensive trade network. Whether it be moving food by carriage or textiles by boat, Cyrodiil, and more specifically the Imperial City, is the center of trade and commerce. The imperial need for trade has given birth to monopolies like the East Empire Trading Company, a mercantile group chartered by the emperor himself. Thanks to their economic influence, the imperials surely have left their mark. The gold septum is the main currency in Tamriel, named after the imperial dynasty of Tiber Septim, though you might know him as Talos. The story of the imperial race is one of oppression, rebellion, and eventually, domination. Before the rise of men on Tamriel, the imperial race is said to have emerged out of the original tribesmen who resided in Cyrodiil, as well as the original Nords who arrived in Tamriel from the continent of Admora. In a time before the First Era, this young, then primitive race were enslaved by the more civilized and refined elves. This particular group of Aldmer called themselves the Aeliads. Before the word Imperial touched mortal lips, the Aeliads had established the first empire Tamriel had ever seen. An ancient Cyrodiil, the Imperials toiled in service to their elven masters, but that would soon change because of one woman and her prayer. Alicia was born in one of Cyrodiil's many human tribes, and grew up like all humans of Cyrodiil did in the first era, as a slave under the Aeliads. The Aeliad civilization worshipped the moralist Daedra, bargaining with them to help keep the younger race of man subservient. Alicia prayed desperately for her people's deliverance, and the bones of Nern itself would answer her. Akatosh, the dragon god of time, heard Alicia's prayers for help, and gave her his blessing, a blessing that would one day lead to the birth of the imperial race. Saint Alicia was blessed with dragon's blood, and with it an Adric artifact called the Amulet of Kings. Handing the amulet down to Alicia, Akatosh made a promise to all of mankind that so long as the Empire shall maintain its worship of Akatosh and his kin, and so long as Alicia's heirs should bear the Amulet of Kings, Akatosh and his divine kin shall maintain a strong barrier between Tamriel and Oblivion, so that mortal man need never again fear the devastating summoned hosts of the Daedra Lords. With this covenant, Alicia spearheaded a great rebellion against the Daedra-loving Aeliads. After forging alliance with the Nords of Skyrim, who themselves conquered the Snow Elves, man fought side by side to free Cyrodiil from its elven yoke. After a long campaign against their masters, Elysian and Nordic forces surrounded the beacon of Aeliad civilization, the White Gold Tower. It soon fell, and the Aeliads, once proud and mighty, were driven from Cyrodiil. Know this. 
That day marked the second greatest moment in man's history on Tamriel. The history of the Nords is the history of man's arrival on Tamriel, and Cyrodiil is the throne from which they will decide their destiny. The Elysian Empire is considered to be the first empire of the Imperials, not to be mistaken with the first empire of the Nords. One of the first challenges facing this new empire was the establishment of a religion acceptable both for the people of Cyrodiil and for their Nordic allies, who were opposed to any elven deities. Saint Alasia established the Eight Divines, which incorporated elements of both Ald Mary and Nordic religion. Alicia's compromise was so successful that this religion continues to be the dominant religion on Tamriel even to this day. With this newfound religion that sought to unite cultures, Saint Alicia's successors would expand their empire all the way into High Rock, thus eclipsing the empire their alien masters once ruled. Although their empire reached far and wide, the Elysian Empire would one day crumble from within resulting in a great civil war that left Cyrodiil divided for centuries to follow. As is the popular trend of history, Cyrodiil would not be united again until tragedy threatened its people. It is the closing years of the First Era, and the Elysian Empire is now but a distant memory. Tamriel is divided, and Cyrodiil even more so. Someone somewhere must have smelled opportunity because something was amiss in the neighboring province of Morrowind. On Tamriel's eastern coast, raiders were making landfall from Akavir, and they seemed to have their eyes set on one goal. With the utmost haste, Akaviri forces pushed towards Cyrodiil through the Jarrow Mountains. The invaders swept through Tamriel with ease until one man stood in their way. The Son of the West, Raymond Cyrodiil. By capitalizing on a mutual need for survival, Raymond Cyrodiil managed to muster an army to oppose the Akaviri invaders. In order to accomplish this, Raymond had to unite the peoples of Cyrodiil for the first time since the Elysian Empire. With this newfound army at his disposal, Raymond not only stopped the foreign invaders, but he convinced them to help him build his own empire, which went on to conquer most of Tamriel. The second empire of man had dawned, ushering in the second era with it. Empires are destined to rise and fall. The Imperials knew this better than anyone. When the second Imperial Empire fell centuries later, the nine provinces of Tamriel sadly fell along with it into disarray. This time period is called the Interregnum, and it was the darkest moment in Tamriel's history. Living standards were in decline. Roads and cities fell into ruin, and even the famed Amulet of Kings was lost, thus suspending the covenant Akatosh had made with mankind and enabling the Daedric Prince Molag Bal to invade Tamriel. The Imperial Province devolved into a collection of warlords squabbling over a no man's land. Centuries later, and ironically enough, it would take a Nord to reunite the Imperial Province. And he did more than just unite it. He brought the Imperials a civilization, the likes of which Tamriel had never seen. Tiber Septim took the chaos and disorder of the provinces and united them under the Imperial banner. Nine provinces, each with their own unique races and history, are drawn together into one identity. Tamriel stands as one collective people, and the nine provinces knew a peace and prosperity that was unprecedented. The Imperials now stand at the apex of civilization. Their third empire achieved more than any civilization before it, and its influence on Nern will echo for millennia. Like all empires before it, this one too would inevitably fall, but in the meantime, Imperial culture will creep its way into every corner of society. The Imperials have left their mark, and Nern will not soon forget them. But let us not forget, the ideas of empires was not a construct of man. Before men knew the word civility, the Aeliads erected an empire of their own. With a society so rich and sophisticated, the Imperials to this day emulate it. But that is a story for another day. <laughs>